morning we want to welcome you to Christ Wesleyan Church. Let's stand and sing together. Good, I want you to do it again. Christ alone. Sing it now. Cornerstone, weak made strong. 
in the Savior's love through the storm he is Lord Lord of all and all of God's people said Amen. that's good stuff right there I don't know if you are facing a storm this morning or if you came in here and you feel weak you're in great company because that's what we are. We're sinners saved by grace. We're just glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So thankful that you chose to be with us. I see some new faces. My name is Mark Norris. I'm pastor here at Christ Wesleyan. And it's just our privilege and honor to have you join us. So before we continue in worship this morning, going to do things a little different. I want you to turn just for a minute and, and greet each other. At least five people. Tell them you're glad to see them. And then as soon as you do that, have a seat for me because i got a couple of announcements for you. So go ahead and turn around and greet each other. All right, I really hate to interrupt you, but I'm going to ask you to find a seat, if you will, please. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Again, thank you so much for being here, and I did not mention this earlier, but if you are a guest of ours, I'm going to ask you to do something specifically for us today, and in the bulletin that you received when you came in, there's a tear-off portion, and I'm going to ask you to fill that out for us. It's not so that we can harass you or stalk you, it's so that we can connect with you. And what I want you to do with that is either place it in the offering when it's passed later, or turn it in as you leave today because we have a special gift we want to give you. If you're a guest of ours, we have a special gift thanking you for joining us this morning. And we want you to take that away and uh, hopefully this service is a gift to you as well. We've been in a series now for, this is week four, called Love Does. And I just had to highlight this this week because as you all know, in the last few weeks, uh, horrible storms, tornadoes in Greensboro, just our neighbors, uh, just to the east of us, um, Strange as this sounds, where I used to work in Greensboro, it was the area that I served. Uh, when I was in sales, I, I sat in many of these homes that were destroyed, um, giving my presentation and, and trying to help these folks and just to see the houses leveled, roofs pulled off. I mean, you've seen the news footage, I'm sure. Earlier this week, a team from Christ Wesleyan, and there should be a picture on the screen for you to see, uh, joined Samaritan's Purse. Uh, they've got a, an operation set up there and went over and just worked all day long and uh, took off some some in this picture took off work uh, the, What my favorite part of this picture is is look how many youth are in that picture And i'm just so thankful for you teenagers and for your heart and your willingness to serve um, uh, You will never ever go wrong showing love in that fashion. So i'm so proud of you And uh, of course I did hear in this picture you see uh, the lady in the far right is a dear friend of mine and Karen's, Pat Atkins. She and her husband have been here several times. I used to work with her husband. And I mention it for a couple of reasons, because as soon as she saw you all come in, she recognized you. And she texted me. She said, you wouldn't happen to have a bunch here from your church, would you? And I said, actually, we do. So she called up with them. Of course, you see the picture. But, of course, all of them wanted her to ask me where I was, why I wasn't there. <laughs> so... Uh, I appreciate the, the, little, the little grill right in the ribs there. I need that, that accountability. But, uh, but no, it was awesome. And we're going to have many, many, many more of these opportunities in the future. But I just had to highlight uh, people fleshing out exactly what we've been talking about. Because they didn't know any of those victims. But they rolled up their sleeves. And, uh, and I heard even, uh, I won't mention any names, but her initials are Julie Freikalt. Her feet were filthy. And uh, she, really, she really got dirty for Jesus. So she was the hands and feet of Jesus. Amen. Um, so, so glad that they went. And then one other announcement real quick that I just want to present. In your bulletin today, you have a blue sheet. And I would ask you to, uh, the, the one on the screen uh, is the one we used this past weekend, why it's not blue, but it's the same information. And what I want you to do with this is in, this, in our conference this past Sunday night, we challenged our body in the coming year, we want to erase our debt. So first of all, let me say, if you're a guest here this morning, um, we don't expect you to even listen to what I'm about to say. But our members and regular attenders, our, our leadership felt led 
that during this coming year, uh, we all can make a faith promise. Now, let me, let me say something. Somebody challenged me this week, and I appreciate it. Because I don't want anybody to think, well, great, all we're going to hear about now is money every week, uh, how we need this, and how we... No, 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 we're not either. That's between you and God. That's why this says equal, not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. And whatever God leads you to give may not even be on this sheet of paper. Um, like I said, the, the ori- original thing was everybody was going to be challenged to give $1,000 extra in the new year. Some can do that. Some can do more. Some can't do that. And that's okay. And we challenged Sunday night that starting as, you know, even you teenagers, I'd say 16 and up. If, if you have a job and God leads on your heart, lays on your heart to give something, by all means do. But you can read and you can see what the options are there. But one of the things that I feel strongly about and, and, and always have is that I believe that leaders should go first. So here's my commitment, mine and Karen's commitment right here. It's going in the offering basket this morning. And another thing about this I want you to know is your pastor is not going to be the one looking at all these. Uh, I'm not spiritual enough to handle the financial end of things. So God provides Todd and Karen and lots of other people to do that. But I just believe leaders should go first. And Karen and I have been praying and we played our little game where we wrote our number down separately and came together. And God spoke to both of us in much the same way. So I just challenge you today. I don't even want you to be impulsive and fill this out this morning in haste. Some of you may have brought yours this morning to turn in. If you did, that's awesome. If you didn't, take it away and pray about it and ask God what he would have you to give. But again, thank you so much just for being here and for worshiping with us. We're going to have an incredible day. I'm going to turn things back over to you guys as you lead us in worship. Let's stand again. As you stand, I just want to go to the Lord in prayer before we continue to worship him. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here this morning to to enter in this room as a body of Christ and to um, join together and sing your praises because you are worthy. Lord, you are so worthy. And right now we just want to turn our focus, our entire focus over to you, God. We want to worship you. We want to be grateful and we want to thank you for all you've done for us, for being with us through all the storms. God, we need you. Father, we need you in this place. Lord, may your presence just surround us into our hearts, God, and just may you be blessed by our worship right now. In your name I pray, amen.
listen to His Spirit this morning. What is He saying to you? Where is He leading you? Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever. stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made strong. come forward assist commit our offerings and our gifts and ourselves to him Lord I am yours and you are mine nothing else matters Do we get that straight? Do we believe that from the depths of our hearts? Call us by name, Lord. And we call you Father. We offer ourselves. We give all that we are. 
all that we have because it's all from you anyway. Lord, as we freely give out of love and devotion, as you have given to us, we pray for your blessing upon all that we return to you. It will be used for your kingdom, for your glory, for the proclamation of the gospel. That people may come into right relationship with you, and they too would be able to say, I am yours. If there's one truth I've discovered in life, it's this. Many people exist, but few people actually live. In fact, in a world filled with definitions, in a world that seems endless, in a world that feels like, what in the world am I doing here? Is it possible to know the meaning of life? Is it possible to have a sense of definition, and purpose, I believe there is. Jesus described life. He said it like this in John 10, 10. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. With a few choice words, he took all of life and boiled it down to one crafty definition. He said, if you want meaning, if you want purpose, if you want definition in life, If you want your life to be something that's not merely just some seed floating through its existence, but if you want to have life that turns into something, that takes on shape, that takes on form, then you'll find that life relationally connected to Jesus. That's where the life is. Pursuing at all costs a passionate, God-centered life. Thrive or survive? Which describes you? Which of these have you signed up for in life? And I guess the better question is, do you, do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus intends for you and me to thrive? Not just to simply exist. I love that statement that... Few people really live. Most people just exist. Just this week I was reminded again of how we are all so much alike. 
when it comes to what we are looking for and what we need. Now, we find different ways to fill that void. Some may be more toxic than others, and, but the reality is we're human beings and we're searching for answers and we're looking for something to fulfill us and to join this thing called life, the adventure called life. But that's what Jesus said. He said to go live a really, really full life, one that's chocked full of adventures. Look with me at your notes this morning. The gentleman on the video just quoted John 10.10. He, he wants us to live the adventure, all of it. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Other versions say in abundance. But in all honesty, the life we've been describing for these last few weeks as a part of this whole series of Love Does, it is the life of adventure. That God intended for us to live. And I hope, really hope, we haven't really revisited it, but I'm going to just for a brief second. I hope you've been choosing to participate and flesh out the teaching. You know, last part of every message has been kind of love does, what you can do to practice it. I hope you're doing some of that stuff. To, to show the love of God to a world that, that desperately needs to see it. But in this week four, we come to an obstacle that stands in our way. We come to an obstacle that's in direct opposition to us doing what God intends for us to do, to leading us. And it affects every person on the planet. It's that nasty little four-letter word, fear. Fear. Can we get incredibly real right from the start today? Look at your notes at those questions I put on there. And I want to start with the first one. What are you afraid of? I mean, what are you afraid of? I, I looked this week just to see if it's changed any. Top ten fears. Anybody want to take a stab at guess number what number one is? Arachnophobia. You're exactly right. The fear of spiders. Now, it does affect uh, women four times more than men. Number two, aphidiophobia. Fear of snakes. Three, acrophobia. The fear of heights. Four, agoraphobia, the fear of open or crowded spaces. Five, see if anybody knows this one, cynophobia. It's not the fear of sin. Cynophobia, anybody know? It's the fear of dogs. Astrophobia, the fear of thunder and lightning, thunderstorms. I, one of our daughters is terrified, and she's over the age of 20, and she still huddles with a blanket when the, when the storms come. Claustrophobia, we all know what that one is. Number eight, Mysophobia, it's the fear of germs. Number nine, aerophobia, the fear of flying. Number ten, markophobia. Pastor Mark, no, that was not on the list. Number ten, tripophobia. Does anybody know what that is? The fear of holes. Anyway, I'm not really talking about everyday phobias like fear of heights and all those that I just listed. I'm talking about the fears that keep you awake at night. Fear of God. Fear of rejection. Fear of failure. Fear of other people. Fear of the future. Fear of change. Here's one for you. Fear of trusting other people. What about a fear of commitment? Or a big one that a lot of us, if we are honest, is the fear of death. Maybe I didn't mention the one that you're thinking of, but for me, I was thinking, what am I afraid of? I mean, other than my wife. I think my biggest fear, if I can just be honest with you, is my biggest fear is trying to succeed in life at all the wrong things. You know, kind of like climbing the ladder, if I will, of success and getting close to the top and realize it's leaning against the wrong wall. I, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to waste my life on something that, that doesn't matter. And I don't know if I mentioned one that you're thinking of, but look at the next question on your notes. Are there fears that keep you locked up inside, in chains, in a prison? Chances are that the fear that you have has not always been a part of your life. It, it usually happens because you've been through an experience or situations or circumstances which have led you to build some walls and barriers 
around you and your heart and your life. So there's little to no chance, Pastor Mark, of it ever happening again. I've talked to some of you and I've done it myself. That's, that's human nature. Look at the third question. Is, is fear keeping you from chasing after what Jesus is calling you to? I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way. But whatever the fear is that came to your mind, is it affecting your life as a follower of Jesus? Is it stopping you from fully pursuing the life that Jesus wants you to have? And then probably the most important question on here is that last one. Is there a way to address the fear in your life that would bring about freedom? I mean, is there a response factor? Is there a way that you could acknowledge it and more importantly you could focus on and attend to the fear that is in your life that might ultimately help you break free? To experience this life full adventure, to to experience this life in abundance and to the full that Jesus describes and intends for all of us to have. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's turn together to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, if you don't have a Bible, there's some underneath the seats in front of you that you can pull out if you like to have the touch and feel of a real book. Or you can bring it up on your uh, Mobile phone, smart device, whatever, it's on the screen, it's everywhere. So you can find it somewhere in here this morning. But Mark chapter 6, very familiar story that you've probably heard before, either in Sunday school growing up, maybe vacation Bible school. But I want us to look at it a little bit different today. Because this is the story of the disciples, and they're on the water, and the storm, and again, you probably at least have heard of it. But what I want us to do today is I want us to take a look with extreme focus, not only on Jesus and what, you know, he does and says, but on the disciples and the decisions that they make in this story. Mark 6, starting with verse 45. Immediately after this, now pause there, what's after this? Jesus has just finished feeding the 5,000 with a number three combo from Long John Silver's. I mean, a miracle of all miracles. He's just finished doing that, so that's immediately after this. Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. After telling everybody goodbye, excuse me, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land. Uh, would, would somebody or would everybody read the next two words aloud, please? He saw. Circle that or underline it if you will. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. <laughs> Look at this next phrase. He intended to go past them. We'll come back to that in a second. But when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I am here. And then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. I didn't put these observations on your notes, but... Uh, On the back, I think you have a little space if you want to jot some of these down. That's up to you. But I want you to look with me just a few things from this story because I think it's so key for us to, to plug into what happened here and how that affects my life and yours. The first thing I'll notice is this. Do you notice the very first thing in the story is their obedience? I mean, Jesus said, hey, get in the boat and go across the lake. Obedience always, always puts us in the place that God wants us to be. The disciples were instructed to get in the boat and head across the lake, and they did just as they were told. Now, sometimes we read the story and we think, well, uh, Pastor Mark, are you sure they're obeying? Because, I mean, there's a storm. Just because we obey doesn't mean life's going to be a bed of roses. But the most important thing is this, that we obey God. We obey what he says to do. Notice also, I pointed it out a moment ago, that it says that Jesus, he saw. He saw in verse 48. Even though he may have gone up into the hills to pray, he was watching them the whole time. He saw the predicament that they were in on the lake. And then that phrase, he intended to go past them at the end of verse 48. Have you ever wondered, I don't know if you've ever even noticed that part of the story, but have you ever wondered what this means? I I really think Jesus was initially going to, 
let them solve the problem. He was going to let them face the circumstances and the situations they found themselves in. He was going to go past them. But then also notice how the disciples, even before Jesus decides to walk on the water towards them, they were already afraid of the storm before Jesus ever appeared. The the initial feelings of being afraid, the scripture says, (laughs) turns into being terrified. And I mean, heck, who could blame them? I bet they weren't used to seeing ghost-like figures walking on the water on all of their other fishing trips. I, I wouldn't have been, I'd have passed out. I mean, just boom. I'd have been laying down. But then lastly, look at this. Jesus speaks firmly to them at once with two different commands. Don't be afraid and take courage. I am here. Now, I got to be honest. When I read this, I'm like, Jesus, why didn't you just get in the boat, calm the storm, and then preach a sermon? (laughs) You know? You know why I don't think he does? Because I think in that moment, in that instant, the disciples had a choice to make. They could choose to clam up and be afraid or they could choose courage and to walk by faith. So Jesus gets in the boat and he calms the storm. And need I remind you, as the words of the song says, sometimes he calms the storm, other times he calms his child. And I don't know what storm you're in this morning. As I get older, I'm learning that everybody is facing something. Everybody's got a battle they're in the middle of. Everybody is struggling with something. And and my new motto is, I I, I put the fun in dysfunctional. I mean, sincerely. I don't know what you're facing this morning, but I do know that in this story, I think we we can learn some huge lessons on what does all this mean for us when it comes to living our lives in a love does Fashion. Flip your notes over with me and let me hit on a couple truths. Because as we ponder this, as we ponder how God wants to receive uh, us to receive this teaching of love, of love does, I've even talked to some of you in the last few weeks. Some of this is just no-brainers. You're like, of course, Pastor Mark, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Yes, yes, amen, yes. But then if we're honest... There are certain parts of this challenge of being loving people and love does that make us a little bit uncomfortable. A little bit outside the box. Like maybe we've never done that before. Maybe we've never been challenged to to love in exactly this way or that way. And and if we're honest with ourselves, and and more importantly, if we're honest with God, we'd have to say, God, I'm just not so sure. And that's why I think this obstacle of fear has you and me sitting right beside the disciples in the boat facing the same choices they faced. Look with me at your notes because the first one, fear is a choice. Now you might argue with me there. No, it's not, Mark. It's an emotion. It's a feeling It is all those things, but ultimately it's a choice. Fear is a choice. And when you and I lean on our Creator, our Father God, and we entrust ourselves to His love, we we suddenly find out that the things we fear the most are not so scary after all. Because have you ever wondered, when we fear, who's the pressure on? It's on you and me. When we trust God, the pressure's on Him. It's not on me. I don't have to be afraid. Whatever from the list earlier that I mentioned that that your fear may be, you don't have to be afraid. The disciples didn't have to be afraid in that moment. And I think that if fear was not a choice, then please explain to me this. Why does the Bible say, and why did Jesus say in this moment, be not afraid? I mean, he didn't say, you know what, it might be a good idea if you weren't so scared. I mean, he was not... He didn't mince words. He just said, be not afraid. It's a choice. And he, I love how Jesus doesn't just come and, and smack us with a truth. He also gives us a way out. He says, be not afraid. Take courage. I'm here. Take courage. I'm here. Fear is a choice. But look at the second one. Fear is only one choice. The second choice is a life of faith. We can live a life of adventure by choosing faith. 
fear or faith? Which will you choose? Fear or faith? It's one or the other. There's not a lot of in-between. There's not really a third choice. Whatever it is that you're facing right now, you're either walking by faith and trusting that God is in control and that He is going to answer and that really, God, God, we need you to intervene. Or you're walking by fear and you're thinking the pressure's on me and what am I going to do and how can I fix this and what are all the options? No, no, and you're leaving God out of it. It's fear or it's faith. So... As I've done every week, I want to ask and answer the question, what what would it look like if we fleshed this teaching out? How can you and I best place ourselves in specific environments to intentionally grow this teaching in our hearts and in our lives? Look with me at the notes, love does this coming week. Love God, love others, do stuff. The first one is welcome a stranger. Welcome a stranger. Behind some of the most... Primal fears is often a basic fear of the unknown. The unfamiliar or the unseen is usually what's scariest to all of us. That's why one of the classic Christian disciplines that can literally heal that fear in you and in me is a practice of hospitality. You say, how so? Well, through hospitality, welcoming strangers or the unknown into our home or reaching out to the sick or reaching out to the needy, we turn our fear into friendship. And we do another small part when it comes to bringing heaven down to earth so that other people can see it. And and this week, I'm inviting you to welcome a stranger in one of three ways. One of three ways. First, you can have a meal with a stranger. This can be anything from buying lunch for and eating with a panhandler to inviting new neighbors over for dinner. It's that easy. Somebody you don't know and you say, well, that's a little bit scary. Hence the reason. You can either walk by fear or you can walk by faith. Maybe the second option, a little less scary, visit somebody who's sick. Or third, go see somebody that's in need. Maybe someone in the hospital, maybe a shut-in that you could call on, someone in prison that you could write a letter to or that you could visit. Ask God to show you somebody already in your life to whom you might extend hospitality. Because... When you and I welcome a stranger, as it says in Hebrews 13, it's there on your notes. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. It's a great way. It's a great way to grow this part of our lives. It's to welcome a stranger. But my favorite option for you this week, and I hope you're going to like this, is number two. Go down to the water. What does that mean, Pastor Mark? Well, I love being around water. I mean, I just do. We were, Karen and I were up in the mountains this weekend, and the river flows right in front of my house. And the only thing that may be more spiritual than that is a plate full of biscuits and jelly at Cracker Barrel. But that's another message for another day. But I love water. I love water, and I have a feeling some of you do too. Whether it's the ocean, whether it's the river like me, maybe it's a lake. Why is that? I think it's because by the water is where life slows down. And its relentless relentless cadence is disrupted. And your invitation this week, I'm giving you permission. I'm giving you permission to find some water and do the following. I listed Matthew 6 there for you. Not the whole passage, but just the first verse. That is why I tell you not to worry, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. But I want you to find some water this week to sit beside. And I want you to meditate on Matthew 6. It might be the ocean. Maybe you're a lucky one in the room and you get to go to the beach this week. Or maybe it's, you know, did you know we're less than 10 minutes from here from Salem Lake? It's beautiful over there. Or find a river, find a swimming pool. Heck, the decorative fountain in our newly constructed prayer garden. Right, Bill? Find some water... And wherever you go, let the water symbolize the place where life slows down for a bit. Take a few deep breaths and just practice being with God. 
You can reflect on where your life is with God if you want to, where He wants to take you next. Maybe you want to consider your fears and where they might come from and what we'll take to surrender them to God. Whatever you do, whatever you do, listen, don't fill this time by the water with activity. Too much activity, even if it's good stuff like reading the Bible, can actually rob you of the benefits of resting. Taking the time to just be. Because the last time I checked, we're not a bunch of human doings, we're a bunch of human beings. And God wants us just to be still and know that I am God. And in my book, there's no better place to do that than buy some water. And Terry, you can take your fishing pole if you want to, too. Look at the last one with me. Serve selflessly. You say, well, what in the world does that have to do with being not afraid, with handling my fear? Because After we choose fear, it involves so many emotions and so many feelings and we get so integrated with that fear. I think the goal here is to love and serve others without them even knowing you're loving them and serving them. And don't forget about the people you don't know. The motto this week is, see a need and simply meet it. See a need and simply meet it. And I gave you three ways to do this. The first one is in your community. In your community, these are more than just those random acts of kindness we were talking about last week. These are intentional. These are specific. Reaching out to serve and love people in the community where you do life. Why? Just because you can. Just because you can. Do you think it might make a difference if you're walking down an aisle at a convenience store tomorrow morning or if you go to the bank tomorrow afternoon and you're walking past and somebody is... You can just tell. They ate grumpy cereal. They're in a bad mood. They've got a scowl on their face. You know one of the greatest ways to love them in that moment? Just smile. Just smile. And they say, what's wrong with you? Say, I'm just in therapy because my pastor told me to be. (laughs) And I'm not saying be fake. No. I'm saying see a need and meet it in your community. Look at the second one. In our church. You know, I've always thought it's so interesting. In the Bible, especially in the Gospels, we hear a lot about who? Peter, James, and John, right? And Paul. What about Matthias? Do you even recognize that name? He's the guy that was chosen to replace Judas. Or, or better yet, how about Justice? who lost out on the job to Matthias? In fact, I, I, I don't think Scripture ever even mentions Justice again. The reality is that doesn't mean that they were not as important or or they didn't matter. There are a million ways to pull this one off in this church. I mean, you could volunteer to vacuum. I'm sure Rhonda and Kent would love for you to run the vacuum cleaner for them. Or maybe clean up the youth room. Maybe filling in for someone as a greeter. Maybe preparing the coffee for a Sunday morning. Finding ways to serve without seeking the notoriety for our acts. This kind of goes against the grain of this point, but I've, just, I've got to acknowledge somebody that did this very thing this week. We were gathering here Wednesday night for our I Am A Church member study, which, by the way, we're still only in week three, so I encourage you to please come out either Wednesday or Sunday and join us in this. We're just, we're, God's really challenging our hearts. But that's not the point. The point is, there was somebody among us Wednesday night who I, I know is in their life very busy. I know that... Uh, typically, at the end of a long Wednesday, they're ready to go home and kick, kick their feet back and relax. But they were here before anybody showed up and after everybody was gone, serving. And that was Matt Baldwin. He was working on our, our, our internet service, our Wi-Fi, so that, so that you can sit in here this morning and check Facebook when you get bored listening to me, right? No, thank you, Matt, just for serving. And he... I, it's probably making him incredibly, you know, uncomfortable for me to even to acknowledge him because that's the kind of heart he is. That's the heart I'm talking about here. That's what love does. It serves selflessly. It, you don't have to put a cape on and announce to the whole world, look at me, I'm Captain Servant. No. Serve in our church, but thirdly, and probably most importantly, in prayer. Focus on praying for the needs of others more than yourself. I would even encourage you to create a prayer journal where you write down the names of people you know and issues they're facing. But don't stop there. Expand it to people you don't know. Like, 
I would bet Julie and Taya and Karen and all of you that went and helped those tornado victims this week, since being with them, do you feel a little bit more apt to pray for them? Like, when, when I'm in situations like that, I walk away going, I don't have any problems <laughs> compared to where they are. I mean, roofs were ripped off of entire houses. People lost everything. Pray for people you don't know, like the tornado victims. Pray for, you know, leaders in our government. Because if you hadn't checked, this world needs Jesus. <laughs> and God can do more in five seconds through my and your, mine and your prayers than we could do on our own in 50 years. And if we really believe that, we should pray like we believe it. Love does. Be not afraid, Jesus said. Be not afraid. Serve others selflessly. I'm going to ask the worship team to come this morning. And as they come, I'm just going to ask you right where you are to, if you will, just bow your head. And no pomp or circumstance this morning, nothing grandiose. I just want to ask you right where you sit, to ask God, how are you supposed to incorporate this message this morning? It's His Word. It's, it's His thoughts. How does He want you to incorporate this teaching? How, how did He challenge your heart this morning? Where is He leading you to change? What is He convicting you of? All those are questions you're going to have to answer. But just in the stillness of the moment, and, and we don't have water in here, but we're just going to be for a second. And the only noise is going to be the instruments behind me. And just for a moment, right where you sit, would you just pray and ask God by His Spirit to speak to you and show you what it is that you need to do in response to find a way to obey. And then I'll close us in just a moment in prayer. Let's bow together. this morning how great and awesome and powerful that you are and God is as great and powerful and as awesome as you are you still come individually into our hearts and into our lives to meet us right at the point of our need and God as we acknowledge from the beginning of this service we are a people in need of you in need of coming to your mercy throne this morning to receive grace in time of need so God, we want to love people like you lead us to, to love. We want to do so without being afraid. But God, if we're honest, there's just parts of this life that, that challenge us. Because, you know, maybe in some ways we've, we've gotten into a rut or we live a certain way. And, or we're just distracted or busy. It's all of the above. God, just help us to stop the madness and slow down and just be with you. Because it's amazing how we will start to see things from your perspective. We'll start to hear things from your perspective. We'll start to feel things from your perspective. And most importantly, we'll start to understand things from your perspective. God, change our perspective. Help us respond to this message this morning in whatever way that you're leading us to. It may mean doing something right after church. It may mean speaking to another person. It may be me doing something this afternoon or contacting somebody, whatever it is. God, don't let us just hear your word and be hearers only, but let us be doers. Help us find a way to obey. We love you. We praise you. And we thank you for your word and for your spirit that does the prompting this morning. We ask all of this in the precious holy name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said together. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? And we're going to publicly declare through this last song that we are no longer slaves to fear. Let's sing it together this morning. You unravel me with
part with me again. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. like Tarzan this morning but you know what I think it's time that we shed the skin of pride and just just be who we are before God that's what he wants us to be more than anything else just be real and raw and honest and say God we need you we desperately need you and if we'll acknowledge that first then we can so greatly show that to the world and they'll see it in us and they'll want the same thing wow so good so good there's tons more of announcements I can make but I'm not going to waste any more of your time you guys can read one more thing I will say about the little handout for the above and beyond some of you might didn't you didn't feel comfortable putting that in the offering plate and that's fine the offering box in the back that's always here some of you give regularly through that according to Karen and Todd if you want to drop it in there it's a little bit more private and confidential that's fine feel free to do so and then last but not least there is a birthday among us Bree Steindale where are you? Happy birthday, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Bree, hold it out, happy birthday to you, yay, happy birthday Miss Bree. Thank you guys so much for being here. Remember, if you're a guest, be sure and grab your your gift on the way out this morning. But most of all, remember, you are loved. Good day. God bless you. Thank you for being here.